This is a recording with Rev. Timothy Toh, 0020007, Real 6. Rev. Um, can you tell us how did you manage to build up your pool of lecturers in FEBC? First of all, I had my brother-in-law, Rev. Dr. Peter Ng, who returned to Singapore the very morning we opened school having got his Master of Theology degree from Dallas Seminary in the United States. That's where you graduated from? Yeah. I graduated from Faith Seminary. So anyway, we started off with two teachers, and then I enlisted one Dr. Inches of the OMF. He was a medical doctor but he was well versed in church history so he stepped in as our church history teacher so as we went along Reverend Philip Hain graduated from Shelton College with a BA also from uh, Moody Bible Institute he, he went to study in two or three places so he came in also to help in the teaching. These were in the very early days, the first two years. And then I got uh, Reverend and Mrs. John Grawley. He had his master's degree also and he came to help me to teach in 1964, two years after we started the college. That is the way we uh, built it up. Did they come in as full-time lecturers full -time. or part-time? Full-time, they stayed for four years. And what was the remuneration like for them? They were paid by the mission. They were fully paid by the mission, so we didn't pay them any Doctor, salary what mission all. are you referring to? Independent Board for Presbyterian Foreign Missions. That is the mission board that sent them. Right. How many lecturers do you have at the moment? We have now 12 lecturers, not counting the English tutors. Right. And who are your students? My students now come from 18 countries or all, all these uh, provinces. Mm. If you would like to, me to name them. How, how, how many students do you have? Now we have got 90 students. Nine zero students. Nine zero, yes. Now, Reverend, how do you account for the growth of your overseas students? It is all by the good results of the students themselves. And so they introduce a school from their own good experience. So. You need not advertise a school. If your school is good, then the name will spread and people will recommend. Right. Yes. So from 1962, when the school first started, and now in 1998, how many graduates did you have from the school? Would be at least 350 graduates. Right. And the degree that is conferred on them? The degrees that are conferred on them mostly are the BTH Bachelor of Theology, Diploma in Theology, and now we begin to confer the degree of Master of Divinity. I think about half a dozen so far, right. Master of Divinity, How and also Sorry. Master of Religious Education. How so recognized are these degrees that's conferred by FEBC? We don't care for this um, being linked up with some theological association mm -hmm. to say that then we are recognized. Right. But we have the recognition of the approval of the Lord through their achievements which I believe is a greater accreditation. For example, we have a Korean student who is coming back 
from Korea to get his MRE, Master of Religious Education. He has got his BTH, Bachelor of Theology. But he has done a great work in translating two of my books. And they are printed in Korean and selling well in Korea. And he has also mastered his English well and so started an English service in Korea. And that English service is going on. But then he got promoted. He has been uh, minister to the Seaman Mission, Korean Seaman Mission. So much so that he has been promoted from Mokpo. It's a small port in the south. Now promoted the Incheon, the port of Seoul. And their association has written us to please ordain him, send him back to be ordained by us. So he's going to be ordained this uh, graduation this Sunday, just two more days. Dr. Toh, can I get you to uh, mention and name these 18 countries for us on record? Yes, starting with Singapore, Malaysia, Indonesia, Thailand, Philippines, Burma, Cambodia and uh, Vietnam, uh, India, Canada, USA, Kenya, Korea, Palau. Palau is a small island near the Guam group. Sarawak. This is Malaysia, but we count them as a different entity. Right. And um, Argentina, Nepal. I got 17 already. That's right. Nepal. So I missed by one. <laughs> mm, that's all right. Yeah. Um, are there any certain criteria in taking in your students to the college in terms of the denomination that they come from? We take in all denominations. The important thing is that the student must be called. If he's not called, he may have a high degree but he will fizzle. Right. So the important thing is that the person must be called. What do you mean by called? That he can testify that he is willing to give up his secular appointments or jobs and he feels that the Lord wants him to serve him full time. Mm -hmm. Everyone who is called knows it. They know the Lord is calling me. So is it then true that you would take in any students even in Singapore, regardless of the churches that they come from? Yeah, we don't care from what church they come. If they're willing to be our student, we right. will... And they will go back and serve their own mother church? Well, we just let them loose. They know what to do. Right. Wherever the Lord would send them, yeah. Can you talk a little bit about the future direction of the college? I'm very happy with the situation of the college now because our faculty is fully agreed and committed to the standard of the college, our doctrine, our beliefs and so forth. No, I can say I cannot say that everyone is exactly the same mind. There may be little variations. But on the whole, on the fundamentals, I feel that we are quite solidly founded. And that um, I'm most happy with Dr. Jeffrey Koo, who is our academic dean. 
and he has been a full product of this college, got his bachelor's degree here. When abroad, he acquired his uh, MDiv and THN and also his PhD so that after his return he has become my academic dean, librarian, and he is the foremost in intellect, I believe, and in the matter of theological questions and confrontations, he is able to hold his own, and he's the editor of the Burning Bush twice a year, which is the standard bearer of the college. And now we are into the fourth year of production. So this journal has been highly regarded by other schools, and they keep it on their shelf. I have this question for you. Um, if all your students come from different denomination, what is the percentage of students after having attended the college, uh, become convinced of the life Bible Presbyterian stand on certain doctrinal issues, the percentage? That is hard to tell. We teach them, they pass our exams, and they accept our doctrines. I believe sincerely because if not, they will argue. But some may just keep quiet, I don't, do not know. However, we believe that it has confirmed a, a good majority of them in our faith, and they go out with that stand with us. Can you cite the example of one of your students who was an Armenian? Yes. Believed? His name is... Uh, Zachariah comes from Kerala, South India, the St. Thomas Evangelical Church, St. Thomas Evangelical Church, that's right, is Armenian. So when he studied under me, he was a bit groggy, he said, well, I have to keep my Armenian position or else when I go back, it will be a lot of difficulties. But I was teaching Romans, and when he finished the book of Romans, he came to tell me, he said, well, Pastor, I am now a convinced Calvinist. I can do no other. I've given up my Armenian position. So I said, what to do? He said, well, that's the truth. When I go back, if they're Armenian, I'm Calvinist. So now he's back in this school. And I think he will run into some difficulties. <laughs> and that is a good example. Right. Um, let's backtrack a little bit uh, and talk a little bit about missions. Uh, you mentioned very comprehensively your two missionary trips to Malaysia. I understand that uh, subsequently efforts were also made to reach out to two churches in Muang and Rawan. Can you elaborate on this missionary efforts? Very soon after our two trips, by 1954, we shared with a John Sung preaching band to take over a mission station called Klapa Sawit. 1954, we kong si with the Evangelistic League, Johnson Group. But after some years, we were the sole supporter. And today, Klapa Sawit is a very flourishing center from which, uh, at which we have built a very nice church, kindergarten, on a half acre of land on the top of the hill. So that is the first fruit Born of Life Church, which is in Malaysia. That was our first fruit, first mm -hmm. branch. And we did not have our branch in Singapore until 1957. 
So you can see that three years ahead we're in Malaysia. Mm -hmm. We went to Moa and Rawang much later. Rawang was 1966 and we built that church. And Moa is due to one of my students. He belongs to a rich family, but Reverend Kwa came to study four years at the FABC and he graduated and he went back to Moa. He formed the Moa Bible Presbyterian Church on his own and he would like to affiliate with us. That's the story of Moa. But Rawang was earlier. Mm. Can you tell us the events leading up to the relationship that was built with the people in Moa and Rawand, as you have mentioned in your book? Well, it started with Rawang, 1966, and it was my own teacher in ACS, Mr. Chiu Kia Song, and the wife, the wife comes from Rawang. So they looked me up, said, Pastor, we need to have you to help in Rawang. Rawang is five miles across the Moa River, very near. Mm -hmm. That they are a dying church, which was founded in 1922. But for two or three decades, there's no pastor. So it's dwindled down to just about five to ten people. You must come and revive our church. So I went there, started to go there once a month. But interestingly, when I passed by that way, the more people say, hey, you're going to Rawang, you're just passing by, you have to minister in Moa also. So I took on two churches. Every month I go there once. And after preaching there for about um, five years, I began to build a church, mostly with Life Church funds. It's a very nice church for Rawang. So what was your weekend like, shuttling up and down? Well, it's once a month. So after preaching here, and I end by 11.30 or 12 o'clock, by 12.30 I step on the gas, by 4 o'clock I'm in Rawang preaching. So it was a full day affair. So after that I come over the more at 8 o'clock to preach. So by the time I get to bed, it was about 10 or 10, 10.30, all exhausted the whole day, and that is once a month. You did this for five years. How do you explain? More than five years, for, for years. years. It must have been for at least um, eight years. How do you account for your motivation of shuffling up and down between well, Singapore I just, and Johor? I just feel the urge. Under the Great Commission, Jesus said you must go into all the world. And under that compulsion, I was happy to establish churches as far and as many as I could, wherever the opportunity came. That was really admirable. Well, as a result of it, Life Church has now at least 48 branch churches. The Lord has given us one per year. And if you want to count, I can count, but of course I lose count. <laughs> yeah, but can you just name as many as you can recall? Well, uh, to start off with Club Asar is the first one. In, so we're starting from Malaysia, In huh? Malaysia. And then we started Zion. It's all from Life Church. Life Church Funds, we founded it. Zion uh, as in over, um, Zion in Malaysia? Zion BP now by Dr. Kwek Suhua right. is our branch church. In Singapore, right? In Singapore. Right. Then from there we have uh, uh, this uh, Sabawang, Galilee, Mount Carmel, and then um, Jurong. That's Calvary Panda? No. It's different. Then uh, Calvary, Jurong, my brother branched out from here. Then he started uh, Calvary Panda. In the meantime, we branch out to um, Sharon Church. They was in Topayo, but now they come back to us. We branch out to East Coast, which is called Grace. 
the English branch out to, to Shalom, and now branch out to Maranatha. Maranatha branch out to Berrien, and um, we have a Chinese service, and then we started the Far Eastern Bible College. Well, that is the biggest branch. The college is founded by a life church. So, these are briefly in Singapore. But then in the meantime, in Malaysia, we founded about another 10 churches. So, out of uh, Klapa Sawit, we had Kula, Kula Besar, Ay Bemban, Bukit Batu, then Mua Israwang, and then Bukit Gambier, 30 miles inland, with a nice church there also. And then we have uh, the Tamil service in Klapa Sawit. Then we branch out to Ulutiram on the east coast. And, and there we have a Kamaman and Kwantan. And now we have bought over Mersing and we're going to build up the Mersing resort very soon. Then Kuala Lumpur side we started two. One is at Taman Sri Melati on the way to Ipoh, and then opposite two miles there is Salayang Segar. These are our branch churches in Malaysia. So we have not counted Indonesia. Indonesia, we got two churches in Batam, Batu Aji and Tanjung Piyu, with two flourishing kindergartens. And then we started in Medan, two churches. Kalimantan, we supported a big field, but we did not make them to be BP. We just allowed them to go on. We started a branch church in Kuching, which is last week approved by the government, registered. So that is in East in Malaysia, Kuching. Kuching. We have, we have a mission in Chiang Mai. The mission is just around here with the children. Burma is a very big setup. We built a college the size of Life Church, four stories. This Life Church. And there they have many churches, but we do not want to count them as our own, but we support the college and the churches. But one of our graduates here went back to uh, Burma, and he has started three BP churches. So these are all our branches, and also in the orphanage. Mm -hmm. And to each one of these, we have bought them a van. The college gets a van. Andrew Kam is getting his van this week. We are sending him 14,000 US dollars. And uh, Thailand, they have a van. Batam, they have a van. Our branches in um, Kwantan has a van and Kuching has a van. All these vans are bought by us to help them in the mission work. Mm -hmm. Then we supported uh, Philippines and now we have got three missionary families in Cambodia. So it's three points, like three churches. And we have uh, established a uh, a foothold in Vietnam and supporting two of the bright students now studying here at the college. So this is a rough, roughly a, a, a picture of the outreach. Right. Looking at the way the church has expanded beyond the shores of Singapore, uh, was it deliberately planned uh, for the expansion? Never. We never planned anything at all. Mm -hmm. We have no, what I call, five-year plan or three-year plan, no. The important thing is that whenever the Lord opened a door, we enter. Like the Church of Philadelphia, I open a door that no man can shut. Mm -hmm. So we go in and the door opens. Right. It's just all the time trying to catch up. Oh, I, I forgot. Tanjong Pinang, Tanjong Uban, these are our branch churches. Mm -hmm. 
and we are thinking of going to Bengkalis on the Sumatran coast, a big island, and it's traced that my wife's ancestry is from there, and they are calling us to go. My wife's grand, maternal grandfather was a Capitan, Capitan's captain, the Dutch confer these big names on community leaders. Mm -hmm. And I visit grandfather was a community leader. So we are going there to return, pay the gospel debt. <laughs> you, when you mentioned West Kalimantan, there was a mention of a gospel book, boat in your book. That's quite interesting. Can you talk we about it? We built this gospel boat very exquisitely, 55 feet long. And uh, the main sitting, the main hall in the in this boat can squeeze in about twenty people. And then um, there are nice cabin beds. I slept there when I visited the Pontianak, and I purposely wanted to enjoy sleeping in the boat for a night. Now <laughs> this boat was built at the cost of 50,000 Singapore dollars in those days, fitted with a, with a 60 horsepower engine, which is very powerful, and uh, was given over to Reverend Junaidi and his family. They then lived on the boat, and they sailed up the Kapwas River, the biggest river of Indonesia is in Borneo a thousand kilometers long. So they live in that boat for about three years, sailing up and down and uh, preaching to station after station and going to tributary small rivers. But after three years, they resolved to rather come to land. So they sold the boat away. So that's where I bought at least uh, three or four pieces of land for Junaidi, at my instance. Mm. The land was so cheap, and I saw beyond that if you buy now, you untong, mm. you mink. And so I helped him after the boat ministry to establish a kindergarten, a church, a primary school, a secondary school, and an orphanage, and a Bible school also, but it fizzled. And he had only Bible classes at night. Mm -hmm. But we would have spent over half a million dollars in a matter of about 11 years, after which time we let him go, you have to be self-supporting. We support him 11 years and spend half a million dollars on it. In all these mission efforts, were there problems with persecution? No. Though there was a, a rioting and then they set fire to the to our college, which which burned down half, and then the fire spread to the neighboring squatters camp. These are all refugee settlements mm. and it came from 1967 there was a um, insurrection in in the area in Kalimantan with uh, Sarawak because of these communist troubles and the Dayaks came out and killed people so many people many Chinese ran to to form this squatter settlement mm. So there was once a, a writing here. Mm. 